Well, it looks like flip phones might be back in fashion. This morning, Samsung unveiling its fourth generation folding smartphones at their event in New York. Tech expert Trevor Long is there for us. Trevor, thanks for being with us. Just what's being updated in the phones? Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And that was news of Samsung rolling out the red carpet for the world's media in New York last week after a two year freeze on mega marketing launches. And in the Big Apple, to cover the show, Nine's tech reporter Trevor Long liked what he saw from morning to night. The Fold and the Flip are very popular among a kind of niche group of Samsung fans, but basically these have been taking just to the next level this year. This has got a better battery life. What Samsung's done here is improved the camera dramatically. This is the design that will please a lot of people, a normal looking smartphone that folds away. As well as singing Samsung's praises for 13 minutes during those four crosses to Today Nine News, Trevor was also sprinkling the magic dust on Sky. They've got good feedback on the, on the products over the last few years. Essentially, they've done everything they need to make these products work in 2022. But what Trevor, Sky and Nine did not tell viewers was that Samsung paid thousands of dollars for him to fly to New York and stay in a hotel for four nights. And how do we know? Because we asked Samsung, who told us 10 journalists and four content creators were flown to the US to cover the launch. And did they fly business class, I hear you ask? Yes, they most certainly did. As for Seven, it had two reporters covering the New York launch, and we're pleased to say it did much better than Nine in owning up to viewers. The tech giant invited Seven News here to New York City for the unveiling of its new phones. The event, which Sunrise was invited as a guest to join other media from around the world, began with an overload of celebrity and tech endorsements. Invited being the code for, Samsung is footing the bill. Also travelling on the phone company's credit card was News Corp tech editor Jennifer Dudley-Nicholson, who banged out a preview and another two stories on the whiz-bang flip folds and accompanied each with this simple disclosure, saying she was a guest of Samsung. It's not hard, is it? As US tech blogger Michael Fisher, aka Mr Mobile, said two years ago... People have a right to wonder whether your coverage is being impacted by things like a fancy hotel you know, mm. or what class of travel you're being flown in or whether you're being flown at all. Four years ago, we highlighted the importance of transparency when it comes to journalists and TV networks covering big tech product launches. And while things have clearly got better, it seems that Sky and Nine missed the memo. In a statement, Nine told us... The team has been reminded of the editorial declaration policy as we acknowledge the disclosure was not clear enough on this occasion. But now to a story that's given the Australians' attack dogs hours and hours of fun. Jacinta Price accuses Sun Herald columnist Peter Fitzsimons of being aggressive and rude to her during an interview. White man berates Indigenous woman. It is a nasty charge to make and very damaging to Fitzsimons. And that was just for starters, with the NT's senator complaining to the Oz. I'm not a wilting violet, but he's a very aggressive bloke. His interview style is very bloody aggressive. He doesn't need to launch in. That salvo in the Oz was just the first of many stories. So, what was it all about? Well, Fitzsimons had interviewed Price for his Five Minutes with Fitz column in Sydney's Sun Herald, and he had gone hard on her opposition to an Indigenous voice to Parliament, asking this question about dividing the country. We're far more unified now than we've ever been in our history. And the most prominent wedge I respectfully submit, Senator, is people like you and your supporters. And asking if it bothers her that... Among your supporters are people with little to no respect for the Aboriginal people. Some of the questions were tough and confronting, and Price, to her credit, did not balk in responding. But after the interview appeared, she told the Australian she felt insulted and that Fitzsimons had been condescending and rude. By this time, she'd also told her Facebook followers... He accused me of giving racists a voice, but that wasn't printed. Fitzsimons hit back with furious text messages to Price, denying her claims and threatening legal action. Senator, you must forget I recorded entire interview. Not a single raised voice on either side, let alone shouting. This is a serious matter, Senator, and you have defamed me. Price duly took down the Facebook post, but... The text messages then found their way to the Australian, which splashed a new exclusive across the front page, with more accusations. Leave me alone. Price pleads with bully Fitzsimons to stop hassling her. This time, Fitzsimons was branded as a woke, wealthy Republican who had bullied, berated and bombarded the senator. And by then, Sky News had also joined the pylon. He's saying that Jacinda Price should be ashamed 
uh, of her positions because he doesn't like some of the people who support her. Now, for fighting this, this voice, this new racism, Price has become a target. But even now, News Corp was only warming up. Over the next three days, its commentators lined up to demand the tape of the interview be released for scrutiny. If Peter Fitzsimons not happy, he can release the tape, and I understand Senator Price is happy with that, and we can all have a listen. If he's got nothing to hide, put it out there so we can all make our own minds up. What could be better than putting a link up on the Sydney Morning Herald website and we can all listen? And did that produce the goods? Well, no. What we got was an assurance from Fitzsimons' editor, Bevan Shields, that he had listened to the tape, there was nothing out of order, and the Australian should move on. But Senator Price was soon back on radio to insist... I'd like them to make the recording public um, and let the public decide. There's no denying that he wasn't aggressive or um, that he wasn't rude, and I stand by the fact that he was. Media Watch also asked for the tape with no success. And with the issue unresolved, the Australian was able to renew the attack on Fitzsimons and give him another couple of whacks. On Friday, Jack the Insider was accusing the columnist of paternalism. And on Saturday, Chris Kenny was charging him with denying Price a voice, which is nonsense, and pronouncing... The imagined moral superiority, arrogance and obscene double standards of the political green left are stripped bare. Seriously, how do they come up with this stuff? with nine stories in The Australian alone. And how do they turn a he-said-she-said said into such a major drama? But most of all, how dare they level a charge of bullying when they behave like that? And now to a story that's been reported around the world that you won't see on the ABC. England overhauls medical care for transgender youth. Tavistock Transgender Clinic shut down by NHS after review finds it is not safe for children. For more than 30 years, London's world-leading Tavistock Clinic has pioneered the treatment of children with gender dysphoria. But in recent years, it's been under mounting pressure, both from a surge in demand and from growing controversy. Two years ago, the BBC revealed staff concerns about the clinic's haste in offering gender affirmation treatment. The implications for this are that young people might not have had other issues addressed before making a potentially life-changing decision to go onto puberty-blocking drugs. That same year, in a high-profile case about the use of puberty blockers, which got scant coverage on the ABC, a former Tavistock patient, Kira Bell, took the clinic to the UK High Court. When Kira was a teenager, she desperately wanted to be a boy. Now 23, she regrets the transition she underwent and says instead she was struggling with a complex identity issue. I was lost and confused and, um, you know, I thought that was the solution to my problems and, you know, they, they led me to believe the same thing. Tavistock eventually won that case on appeal, but earlier this year came another challenge. A review of the clinic by leading paediatrician Hilary Cass found a lack of consensus and open discussion about the nature of gender dysphoria and the appropriate clinical response. Or as the UK Observer put it more bluntly... A profound lack of evidence and medical consensus about the best approach to treating gender dysphoria in children. And two weeks ago, UK health authorities closed the gender clinic down promising to replace it with new regional centres, offering a more holistic approach to treatment. Now, this is a significant development in the debate about how to treat gender dysphoria, which was covered at length by... Crikey, The Guardian, The Daily Mail and even The Newcastle Herald. And the Australian slapped the story on its front page, complete with a local angle. Australian gender clinics are under fresh scrutiny and face calls for an independent review of their prescription of puberty blockers to teenagers after a leading British clinic was closed down over safety concerns. That came with a pointed editorial, just in case readers were confused about where the paper was coming from. And on Sky News, Liberal Senator Claire Chandler was making a similar point. I think we have an opportunity now, with the Tavistock being closed in the UK, because the treatments that they're providing were not fit for purpose, to really start asking those questions. So, here we have questions and arguments about an important issue of our time. How to provide the best possible treatment for children with gender dysphoria. And how to ensure they're not rushed into life-altering decisions. But, two weeks on, we can't see any trace of the story on the ABC. Not on its news bulletins, or across its many TV, radio and online platforms. And that's strange, because the ABC has many positive stories on trans issues. 
like this one in January about how Ellie came to terms with her transgender identity at the age of seven. This one in March on young Australians exploring gender more than ever before. And this one in May about gender service wait lists causing a mental health crisis in Queensland. So, we asked the ABC why the closure of the London Clinic and the debate around gender dysphoria treatment was seemingly of no interest. It told us... The focus of our coverage is what is happening in Australia and Australian practices differ significantly to those that were in Tavistock. The change in Britain's model could certainly form part of future coverage where it's relevant. Well, we believe it is relevant now. And if the ABC is convinced it's not, perhaps it should run an article explaining why that is so. We've criticised the Australian in the past for being relentlessly one-sided and alarmist in its coverage of this issue. We reckon the ABC is now in danger of being similarly one-sided, but in the opposite direction, by ignoring legitimate debate about the treatment. But finally, to a new skirmish in the climate wars, sparked off by this big splash in the Nine Papers on Thursday. Giant wind turbines on horizon. Dozens of wind turbines, almost twice the height of the Sydney Harbour Bridge, may soon be seen off the coast of Australia after the federal government last week named six areas it hoped to declare suitable for the industry after years of delay. Yes, if it happens, it should be good news for the climate and great news for jobs. In Newcastle, Wollongong and Gippsland, where the most advanced offshore wind project, Star of the South, promises to provide 2,000 construction jobs and 200 long-term positions and power 1.2 million homes, or around 20% of Victoria's energy. Sounds good, doesn't it? But not till the fossils at Sky After Dark, led by the Australian's Jenna Clark and the IPA's Gideon Rosner, who combined to pour scorn on the idea. Imagine if they plonked these right in front of the Point, Point Piper mansions. Just see how that would go. Yeah, down they should. They absolutely. <laughs> that is a uh, Jenna. That is the best idea I've heard all week. Now, in case you're wondering, that's not going to happen. Offshore wind farms are built miles out to sea. But what do Sky's energy experts have against them? Well, not only do they look horrible, said Rosner, they don't provide that much power. They go and ruin the coastline with these ugly, ugly windmills. And the worst part is they won't even work. One problem with these, uh, over, uh, these windmills in the sea is that laying the cabling for them is very, very difficult because the currents keep yeah. shifting them around. These are basic technical <laughs> questions that have not yet been worked out. And that is what's so frustrating about the energy debate. We are powering our cities on wishful thinking. Really? So, how come the Brits, Danes, Dutch and Germans have built all those wind farms in the North Sea, with thousands of turbines spinning merrily away? They must be clever in Europe, but then so are we. Australia laid a telegraph cable to Indonesia despite those difficult currents in... When was it? Ah, yes, 1871. And others have also cracked the code. In the Asia-Pacific region... Submarine cables, fibre optic cables laid in the ocean carry more than 99% of intercontinental communication traffic. At present, there are more than 500 subsea cables in operation. Cables traversing the Pacific can reach more than 10,000 miles in length. So, we asked Gideon Rosner if he stood by his comments, and he assured us he does, telling us offshore wind power will be expensive, which may well be true, and citing a six-month outage in the BassLink cable carrying electricity to Tasmania back in 2015 as an example of the problems the projects could face. And uh, does any of that suggest wind farms won't work? No. But Rosner and the IPA argued that Australia needs more fossil fuel power instead. Writing on Sky last week... Let's kick the decades-long habit of running our energy grid on wishful thinking and go back to energy sources that we know Australia can do and do well. And tweeting... By all means, let's debate nuclear energy, but in the meantime, we have cheaper, easier solutions ready to go. Coal and gas. And uh, never mind the climate or those extra carbon emissions. So why is the IPA so fond of fossil fuels? Well, in the past, it has taken money from oil giants ExxonMobil, Caltex and Shell. And its biggest donor has been iron, coal and gas tycoon Gina Reinhart who provided a third of the IPA's budget in 2016 and 2017 with secret donations of $4.5 million. Reinhardt wants to build two new coal mines in Queensland and expand production of coal seam gas. Might that be why the IPA dislikes wind farms so much? We asked Rosner what proportion of the IPA's funding now comes from the fossil fuel industry. He declined to tell us. You can read his full response on our website, along with statements from Nine and the ABC. That's all from us for tonight. 
Don't forget Media Bites every Thursday. Nothing now till next week. Goodbye.